Genesis 45 this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to um, just understand your heart more uh, towards us. Lord, in addition to that, uh, just to dig into your word and, and Lord, to just see uh, the examples of people who've gone before us and have, have lived well. God, I pray that we would relate well to you and to others as we understand your word more this morning. Thank you for your love. We thank you for bringing us here today again. In Jesus' name, amen. So, hey, I got my license like a month before I was 18. Long for some, short for others. Some people get it much later than that. Most of my friends had it as soon as they turned 16. And so a month before 18, I was a little late to the game. So senior year, I was riding the bus, and I think I was one of the only seniors who was riding the bus. I'm not bitter about it. I'm not embarrassed about it. But I remember one day I came out of the bus, and our school principal was standing outside of the bus, and he said, Samuel Wilson, you ride the bus? I said, yes, I ride the bus. What's wrong with that? Anyway, I finally got my license, and I was very, very excited. And one of the things I was excited about was that my dad told me, when I got my license, he was going to give me his, his second car. And so I was excited that not only I would have a license, but I would have a, a second car. And I was looking forward to having this car. And it wasn't just any extra car. It was uh, an extra car that was, was extra large. Some people refer to these types of vehicles as boats. <laughs> It was made in 1983, the same year I was born, and it had a few quirks. And so when I arrived the night before, this is what I, the kind of car that I was looking at, getting into. And my dad drove me around in the car, and, and he was kind of just pointing out all the different things I was going to have to manage. For example, it had a very large and wide gas tank. And so when you would turn left to right, sometimes the, the gas light would come on. Uh, there was another light, a check engine light that he had a piece of tape over. And I said, why is that piece of tape there? And he's like, oh, that light won't go off. I don't know why. Uh, so, you know, it, the, the paint was, was quite tarnished. It was actually not a, a cool blue like that. It was kind of a maroon, a tarnished maroon color. And so he takes me out to drive and he was telling me about, you know, all the different quirks. And I had a friend go out there with me uh, to pick up the vehicle and, and I slept the night before, and I was all set to go the next morning as long as the car started. Okay, so we woke up in the morning, and my uncle, Scott, he flew in. Uh, it, it was over in Tri-Cities about three and a half hours, and he loves to fly. So he's like, hey, I'll meet you out and drive back with you. And, and so we get up the next morning, and I'm getting ready to, to get into the boat, and my dad takes out the keys to his car. And he said, no, you're not going to have that car. You're going to have this car. And I was overwhelmed. I actually, uh, I don't know, in, in overwhelming situations, I, I, I don't like jump up and down. or I just kind of was like, you're kidding. Wow. Like, that's the way that I was. And, and he hands me these, these, these keys, and I can't even believe what's happening. It's almost like I'm in a dream or something. And, and so I, I, I drove home, and on the way home, my, uh, my Uncle Scott said something to me like, man, if I was given that car, I would have, like, jumped up and down and, like, hoop and holler. And I'm just like, I didn't even know what to do. Like stuff like this was so, I don't know, it felt foreign and I felt like I didn't even know how to receive this, this awesome gift. But when I got home and I was alone, I went up to my bedroom and I just wept. It was so deep and it wasn't even about the, I mean, I was excited to have a cool looking car. Don't get me wrong. But it was more about the, the heart of, of my father to give me this vehicle that was his and it meant the world to me. And so I, I, I wept and I wrote him this card and I just told him how much that that meant to me. And it was incredible, incredible. And it was one of the times in my life where I would say I was having tears of joy. This week, uh, we're going to look again 
at the life of Joseph. And we've been going through the life of Joseph. And I'm kind of trying to like condense this down to three weeks, but we could have gone like six on this, this life because it's an incredible life that he lived. And we're going to continue to look at how he finished and how his life went after the time of, of, of great persecution and tribulation, what happened. And as he's reunited with his brothers and with his father, Joseph had a complex history, sold into slavery by his brothers who were jealous of him, going into this house of, uh, of, his, of a slave owner, a, a leader in Egypt who, who, while he's there, he becomes accused by his wife, and then he gets put into prison after being falsely accused by his master's wife imprisoned, forgotten, and then brought out of prison and placed and set as prime minister or second in command in all the land of Egypt. Joseph had interpreted a dream for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and this dream was indicative of, of seven years of plenty, of great plenty, followed by seven years of famine, and they needed someone who could administrate this well. And so as he's telling the king about what's going to come, the king says, I know who's going to administrate this well, it's you. And so he goes from, from, from prison to prime minister. Surely that sort of elevation was quite uncommon. But ultimately he's brought in to administrate the land and, and with Joseph in charge of the food for the seven years of plenty, he stored up so much food that it was countless. He stored it up because he knew that there was a famine that was going to come after seven years. And in that famine, they were going to need all of this food. And so what we talked about last year was, was what Joseph named his sons. He talked about the fact that God made him fruitful in his affliction and he allowed him to forgive the things of his past. And so when he heads into this, this, this famine, this time of famine, it ravaged the land of Egypt, and it ravaged the entire earth, scripture says. It was so bad that, that people in surrounding countries and surrounding areas were running out of food, and everyone who needed to buy food was going where? They were going to Joseph. And so after two years of this terrible famine, his father, whom he had been estranged from, hadn't seen now for 15 years, finds out that there's a, a, a guy in Egypt who's second in command and that people can go there and buy food from him. And so he tells Joseph's brothers, his brothers who had sold him into slavery, he says, hey, go out to Egypt. There's a guy there who you can buy some food and grain from and go out there and buy some grain. And so after two years, Joseph is there and who comes before him? but his brothers, his brothers who had sold him away. And what Joseph does is he, he, he disguised himself, certainly welled up with emotion. He disguised himself so that they wouldn't know who he was, but he knew exactly who they were. And as they come in there, he essentially accuses them of espionage and says, you're spies, I know it. And they say, no, we're not spies. And there's a couple of moments in these interactions where Joseph actually has to pull away because of the emotion that overcomes him. He begins weeping, but he's doing it privately so that they wouldn't know. And so he begins to ask about their family. Well, well who, who do you have in your family? And, and they said, well, they have a father. And there's 12 brothers. One of them is, is gone, which would be Joseph, who they're talking to. And another one's back home. His name's Benjamin. Benjamin is, has the same mother and the same father as Joseph. They're the only brothers who had the same mother and same, I'm sorry, it's Joseph's only brother with the same mother. And so he, of course, wants to see Benjamin. And so what he says is, you need to bring your other brother to me. And he's accusing them of being spies. And they say, no, we can't bring him to you because, uh, you know, our, our, our father doesn't want us to bring him to you. And he said, bring him to me. Bring him to me or else you guys are spies. And they say, well, we're not spies. So he takes one of the other brothers and he kind of holds him hostage so that he would ensure that they come back. They go back home. They tell dad. Dad, this guy out there, he wants us to bring Benjamin back to Egypt. And he says, why? 
I don't want you to take Benjamin because if anything happens to Benjamin, my heart will break. Why did you even tell him that you had a brother named Benjamin? They said, this guy, he was really interested in our family. He wanted to know about everything. And so finally, they end up bringing Benjamin back and he meets Benjamin and there's, there's even some weeping that happens in that scene. And as he's meeting with these brothers, he ends up uh, uh, cooking them some food. He gives his brother Benjamin five times the amount of food of the other brothers. He loved him, right? This is his bro. And so he ends up giving him this food. And, and what ends up happening then is he then sends them off, but he plants a silver cup in Joseph's bag so that he could uh, accuse him of something. And so they head out, and then he sends some of his people. They say, go, go look in his bag. And he had this silver cup, and they come back. And ultimately, he ends up uh, making this accusation and declaring that he must keep Benjamin with him. He says, no, this guy, he stole from me. He needs to stay here. And his brother Judah one of the brothers who sold him away, who was kind of a key person in that, Judah objects because of the grief that it would cause their dad. He said, oh, it would cause our father too much grief. Keep me, keep me, I wanna be here. And so not wanting to grieve their father further, Joseph breaks and he reveals his identity to his brothers. And as we pick up in chapter 45, verse one, we're picking up this story as he reveals to his brothers who he is. Verse 45, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 45, verse one reads, then Joseph could not control himself because before all those who stood by him. And he cried and he said, have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these last two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and keep you alive by great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry. Hurry. And go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you for there are still five years of famine to come. You and your household and all that you have would be impoverished. Behold, your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father all the splendor, all of my splendor in Egypt and all that you have seen. And you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck and he kissed all his brothers and he wept on them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. When his brothers realize that they are standing in front of Joseph, whom they sold off, they're shocked and terrified. Rather than raining down judgment on his brothers, Joseph chooses to reconcile and show amazing character by recognizing God's hand in the outcome of his life. History could not be changed, but Joseph could change the way that he viewed it. And after he revealed himself and after he embraced his brothers and after he weeps as he hugs his brothers, Joseph sends his brothers back home to bring his father there and their entire family and the generations to come would be there in Egypt and they would be safe and secure from this famine. 
And Joseph is finally reunited with his father when tears of joy come streaming down as he embraces his father, this father who he hadn't seen for the last 15 years and the depth of emotion from his soul came flooding out as he's embraced too by his father. As Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, they expect anger and they expect vengeance to flow. But Joseph assures them that they need not worry because of their past sins. The Lord had a plan and he was using him to make a way for their entire family. Despite what they had done, God was using Joseph. And faced with a situation like this, Most would take the opportunity to share with them what the last 15 years had been like. Do you know what happened after you sold me away? Do you have any clue what my life has been like? Do you have any clue what it was like to be enslaved, falsely accused, put in prison? Do you guys have any idea? Given the opportunity, most of us would want to make sure that they felt it. Rather than take the opportunity to pay them back, Joseph revealed to them his heart and his perspective of the past, and he chose a redemptive perspective. And when circumstances bring difficulties from our past to the forefront of our lives, we too have to choose a redemptive perspective. The story of Joseph's life is filled with many choices. And after each circumstance and after each situation, Joseph had a choice to make. And each day within each circumstance, Joseph had a choice that he would have to make. How would he respond to what he was going through? How would he respond to what was? How would he handle the difficulties that he faced? How would he handle the difficulties that he was facing? The choices that he made in pursuing integrity and righteousness in difficulty, prepared him for continuing in integrity and righteousness in victory. And here, as he meets his brothers, he's continuing in integrity and in righteousness in his approach to them. He's continuing with a redemptive perspective of what was and what God is going to do with what was. God granted him that privilege. It's a privilege to have a redemptive perspective. And he recognized that the Lord was at work in it all. And he had placed him there in Egypt for a greater purpose. He was also therefore able to look back through the lens of God's perspective. He no longer looked back on his life with pain, bitterness, or anger. He chose to look back through the lens of God's divine purpose and the pieces that made up the story of his life and that culminated to where he is today, those pieces finally made sense. And not only did they make sense like, oh, I get it, but he was resolved to look back on them through the lens of God's perspective. All of these pieces came together to place him where he was today so that not only he could get out, but so that everyone could get out, so that he could make a way. I went uh, for Casey, my brother's bachelor party. We went to this escape room in Portland. Okay, so they have these things. They're called escape rooms. Why you would want to go? I don't know. You're stuck in this room, okay? And this room, well, okay, if you're into that thing, I love you so much. But for me, I feel like I'm free and I'm free indeed and I want to remain in that freedom. But what you get to do is you go into these rooms and they lock you in there, okay? So you're locked in this room and they have all of these clues. It's like a puzzle. And you're trying to put all of these different clues together in order to escape this room. And the goal is to escape it within an hour. And so you have an hour to get out of this room and finally you get a code and you get out the door and they, you know, have all kinds of confetti and stuff. You know, they're cheering. We did make it out. But, All of these clues come together to get you to the next clue, to the next clue, to unlock this secret door, and you go into this secret door, and then you're stuck in this other room, and you have to get out of there, and finally, you get out of there, and when you get out of the door, one of the the topics of conversation was all of the different clues 
that at the time, as we were looking at these different clues, we had no idea what they were for, what they meant. And we, ha we had the opportunity to look at that. Now, not every clue that I had in there was a clue that was a solution. And so someone else would go, oh, we got it. And then we would move on to the next thing. But when we got out of that room, we were free out of that room. And we could look back on that room and recognize how everything worked together so nicely so that we were able to get out of that room. And I was just thankful that we weren't stuck in that room for an hour. I think it was like 45 minutes. It was 45 minutes too long in my book. Joseph was now able to put the pieces together. Joseph was now able to look at the seasons and the, the signs that led him to his current place. The difficulties, the things that he endured, that yes, they were hard, no doubt. But he recognizes why. History was something he couldn't change, but he could change how he viewed it. And he could look at it through the lens of God's perspective. You know, sometimes um, we have the opportunity to, to change the way that we look at a, a situation or a season that happened. I remember when I was in school, I had this math teacher and I was learning algebra from this math teacher. And this math teacher, I felt like was exceptionally hard on me. Like, you know, he always calling on me in class, always kind of like singling me out. And I thought, what is this guy's deal? And so every day I would go to his class and I would almost kind of like, I don't really want to go to, his name was Mr. Edwards. I don't really want to go to Mr. Edwards' class. And towards the end of the year, I had another class. My teacher, it was like an English class. And so they were asking us to um, state if we came back to school as an adult, whose class would we want to go to and speak at and why? And so we went around the room and I said, well, I would want to go to Mr. Edwards' class so I could show him that I was actually successful in my life. And she was kind of like taken back and then they moved on. You know, she didn't want to make any sort of scene out of it. But she came to me after class and she said, why, why did you say that? I said, he's just so hard on me. And she said, you know what? We talk in our staff meet, in our staff meetings and at lunch. And she said, of all the students in any of his classes, Mr. Edwards really loves you. What? Well, why is he always picking on me? And she said, you know, he, he was just talking about this the other day. He sees great potential out of you. That total, I mean, that I would, if I went back there, I might go to his class, but I wouldn't say the same things. I feel like Mr. Edwards is great. If he's hard on you, he loves you. You know, I don't know. I don't know what I would say, but I had the opportunity to look back on that algebra class completely differently in a moment because I understood that there was heart behind it, that there was some reason uh, behind that season. There was some reason behind why I was going through what I was going through. And when I went through it, when I was going through it, I didn't quite get it, feeling singled out and, and, and pressed hard. But what I understood later and understand now was that I was being encouraged to aim higher. I was being encouraged to, to pursue better things than what I might have done on my own. And he was trying to pull that out in me. It's difficult sometimes, you know, when we endure hardships. Sometimes we, we, we make these choices and other times they happen to us. I made a choice, uh, I don't know, about 10 years ago when Kathy and I were dating and I decided that I was going to see if I could get my car to go to 100 the first time I ever did it. And so I pulled out of this rest stop and man, I gunned that thing and I got up just below 100. I was a little bit nervous when I started getting close to that and I let off. And that very time I got pulled over by a police officer. <laughs> I've never done it again. I haven't done it again. I, I look at that and I go, okay, like I made a really silly mistake I paid for it, and I believe that what the Lord was saying was, I don't want you driving 100 miles an hour, so I'm going to allow you to get pulled over right now. Okay, I got it. I'm not going to do it again. Hebrews 12, 11, all discipline for a moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. In difficulty... We have a choice to make. 
Sometimes things are done to us that are outside of our control. And other times uh, we make choices that place us in our predicament. But in both situations, we have the opportunity to search for God's purpose in our lives. Joseph made the choice. Joseph had a choice to make as he faced his brothers. Would he adhere to the saying, what goes around comes around and humble his brothers? Or would he let forgiveness come back around? Would he let that be his pursuit, to let forgiveness come back around? Because there are times where we will misapply scripture in a situation or, or in a circumstance where we want to settle a grievance personally. And so perhaps we might quote Exodus 21, 24 to 25, which says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. If you knock my tooth out, I'm going to knock your tooth out. If you bruise me, I'm going to bruise you. If you do something to my eye, I'm going to do something to your eye. And, and, and sometimes we're, we're in this pursuit personally. Give me your tooth. You know, we're like going after people in a certain way in order to get back at them personally. And we say, well, it says in, in Exodus 21 that, you know, eye for an eye. So come on over here. Give me your eye. Please know that. That, that in the time that this law was given, this was made in order to settle like judicial issues before a judge, that there would be a judge there and, and he would be able to, to determine. And it was actually because the, the judgments that were coming out were more severe than they needed to be. And so he's saying, no, 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 eye for an eye. And we actually don't see a time in scripture where this was actually uh, this particular thing was actually adhered to, but it was a, a guiding principle for lawgivers. Most certainly it was not being used to settle personal issues. And sometimes we can use this in order to make personal revenge acceptable. If someone punches you, punch them back. If you're insulted, insult back. Jesus actually addressed this, and I'm glad that he did. Matthew 5, 38 to 41, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. This means that what comes around doesn't necessarily go around and it absolutely shouldn't if we're following the teachings of Jesus. We've got to pursue a right response. Interestingly, in those times, Roman soldiers could go to a person and, and make them carry their pack for a mile. Anyone, it didn't matter what they were doing. You're coming home from the grocery store and you have 10 bags. A Roman soldier, soldier could come to you and say, drop everything. You need to take this and we're going to go and we're going to walk a mile together. And so people already hated the Roman soldiers and they hated them even more because they would have to carry these heavy packs for a mile and Jesus is saying, whoever comes to you, and he's referring to, to the Roman soldiers, he's saying, whoever comes to you and says, drop everything, take my pack, and go a mile with them, go too. Don't be mad. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry. Go two miles. Turn the other cheek. What goes around doesn't come back around. Not if we're pursuing the right response. 1 Peter 3, 8 to 9, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And a blessing is exactly what Joseph received. He could have let unfair treatment at the hand of his brothers ruin him, or he could have allowed it to be the catalyst to move him forward and closer to responding the way the Lord would have him respond. At the end of his life, the end of Joseph's father's life, Jacob, also known as Israel, 
He has the opportunity to bless and give a prop- prophecy to each of his sons in their days ahead. And it's really interesting when he gets to his son, Joseph, because prior to this blessing, he says, you're going to get a, 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 a double, a double blessing. And when he gets to Joseph, as he's prophesying over his sons, here's what he says. This is in Genesis 49. It says, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His strong arms remained limber. This speaks of the steadfast faith throughout his life. And like Joseph, we have the opportunity to remain firm in faith. Through all his his troubles, through all his difficulty, Joseph is compared to someone holding a bow who remained steady. He didn't fire back even though people were firing at him. Even though people gave him their best shot. Even though people lied about him. Even though people sold him and gave up on him. His bow, it remained steady. His faith did not fail. He stood strong and he came through it victoriously. His arms remained strong and limber. And ultimately, Joseph was resolved to to stand firm in faith. Joseph held on to his bow and he did not fire back. He did not waver. He maintained his integrity, knowing that God was always with him. He was a fruitful vine. Jacob said that Joseph was a fruitful vine near a spring. His life became fruitful as he remained near the Lord, his source and his spring. And what's important for us today is to always remember and to make God our source. You've got to make God the source in your life. And the Lord becomes your source when you rely fully on him. John 15, 5 and 8, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Let God be the spring of the water of life and the fruitfulness that, you, that, you, that, that exudes out of your life, that, that pours out of your life, will extend over the wall so that others can even enjoy the fruit of your life. The branches and the fruit hanging over the wall indicate and are a picture of Joseph's sons that extend beyond his days and extend beyond his years. What came out of his life and what flowed out of his life was not just integrity and righteousness for him, but in his children. And for his children's children, fruitfulness would come. It would extend over a wall. He was a fruitful vine. Joseph powerly displayed steadfast faith and trust in the Lord, making a way for the generations to come, providing evidence of a fruitful life to those who would follow. What did they see? Did they see destruction? Did they see everything in shambles? Did they see that everything just fell apart because, you know, I got a bad hand. I, you know, things just didn't work out for me. So now you do it. No, we can't just say, oh, things didn't work out for me, son, but they're going to work out for you. So you do better than I did. No, let the fruitfulness of your life extend to the branches that follow. And it's never too late to do that. Others shot at him. But Joseph remained firm. Others went at him, but Joseph remained firm. He didn't waver. He didn't even... It wasn't like... Sometimes when people are firing at us, we start doing that, right? Just don't even talk, don't even talk to me right now. You want, you want some of this? Right? He didn't even do that. He remained steady. 
Others shot at him. Others went at him and he remained steady with his bow. Oh, I don't like this. What this picture is of him holding his bow steady is the picture of someone who had incredible strength to hurt people, to get back at people, to let vengeance be the theme of his life. And he remained steady. He didn't fire back. He didn't go back. He didn't try to get back at people. That wasn't the theme of his life. He wasn't just going to start firing arrows now that he was in charge. And I imagine we see the picture of, of his brothers understanding that he's there and they're terrified and they're dismayed. Can you imagine Potiphar's wife? What? He's She probably wanted to move out of town, but they couldn't because all the food was there. So imagine her going to Joseph. Joseph, can I have some food? Sure. His bow remained steady. He had great strength. John 4, 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water water that I give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Oh, that's the water that I want to drink. That life-giving water that that gives life to me, but also gives life to others and gives life to my my family and my nieces and my nephews and the generations to come and my my younger brothers and and my my younger brother, my younger sister. I want to be a fruitful I want the water that I drink to be the water that will will, will sustain others. I want to be fruitful. I want my my fruit to extend over the fence for the generations that will come. And in order to do that, what I have to do is reflect Christ. At the end of Joseph's life, after his fathers die, there's 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 like another time, another season, another situation that comes because his father's now dead and his brothers come back to him and they're afraid that Joseph is gonna wipe them out. Dad's gone now, guys. Joseph's gonna go nuts. No. And they, and, and, and they came to him. And they said, hey, dad said before he died, you know, to, to make sure that we were okay. And he sees right through that. And how he responds is this way. The way that we've known him to respond his entire life, he says, do not be afraid. Am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. He had a redemptive perspective. Why did that happen? I don't know. But God wants us to look at that with a redemptive perspective. I'm going to pull out everything good from that. And I'm going to move forward. Joseph had the power to condemn and to convict. He chose grace. He chose mercy. He chose to say, I'm not God. As far as you guys go, whatever you did in the past, what you meant for bad, God's using it for good. And I recognize that. Joseph in scripture is seen as a type of Christ who was shot at and hated, but who who bore up under his sufferings and made a way for the generations to come. And he redeemed his people. Jesus was loved by his uh, father, hated by his brothers, betrayed, sold into slavery, made a servant. He was tempted, but he did not act. He was falsely accused and made no defense. He was placed in prison, endured an unjust punishment, but despite it all, he gave grace and he gave mercy and he made a way for all who rejected him. Coming back to them and pouring out his love and pouring out his grace and pouring out his mercy, even by death on the cross and his blood shed as propitiation and payment for you and I so that we could walk free so that we could have life, so that the generations to come would have life, 
He made a way for the generations to follow just as Joseph did in his life. But Jesus, our God, the greater than Joseph, has truly made a way for you and for me. Oh man, and when I look at what Jesus did on that cross, I look at that with great sadness. But what Jesus says to to us today is what you meant, what the people meant for bad, oh, God used to make a way. And he came and he made a way by his blood that was shed on the cross, his life as payment for us. As Joseph meets his father, he gets in a chariot because he knows that his father's coming and he gets into that chariot and he heads that direction. And when he sees his father, he runs out to his father and he hugs his neck and he weeps. Oh, father, it's been too long. It's been too long. And he pours out his heart with tears and a long embrace and the years of of pent-up affection and time lost were culminated as Joseph reunites to his father. The past was behind. Joseph was home. And this morning, the Lord might say to you, come home. Let's leave the past in the past. Come home. tears of great joy and a recognition of the life that some of us have lived, sometimes we will come into that and we will recognize the the heart of the Father towards us. But what he might be saying to you this morning is, come home. I'm coming to you. Will you get in and will you meet me partway? He's available to you this morning. Psalm 30, 11 says, you have turned my wailing into dancing. You have removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. He can turn your wailing and your mourning into into dancing. And he can clothe you with great joy. And as you bow your heads this morning, that might be you this morning, and you might say, I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to come back home with every head bowed, with every eye closed. If that's you, and you want to, to, to know that you're back home with Jesus and allow him to just wrap his arms around you if that's you this morning and you want to enter in back into the relationship with Jesus that you once had and you want to come home if you would just lift your hand and say yes you know what that's me I'm going to run to him this morning I want to run to him this morning if you would just lift your hand you lift your hand this morning know that the arms of the Father are open if that's you and you you raise your hand just look up here right now his arms are open to you Lord Jesus I pray that every hand raised and every heart raised God that you would meet them right there with a long embrace. It didn't matter what was. No, Lord, we are now home. And if you would say this prayer, Lord, I know I need you. God, I know that I've strayed away from your plan for my life. God, I'm ready to come back home. And so would you take your seat as God and King Savior of my life. Would you point me in the way that I should go? Would you turn my wailing and my mourning into dancing? Would you clothe me with joy? Remove my shame. And right now, he's doing it. We love you so much, Lord. We thank you so much that you can turn what was difficult, what was trying, what was awful into great joy. We love you in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen.